Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, there may be some latecomers. I uh, want to welcome everybody to our conference this morning. We're going to um, reach out to uh, the paramedics in the fire department and see if we can get them involved in some of our conferencing. So we're excited about that. They usually run uh, a shift uh, every day. You're on, you're on one, off two and a 24-hour shift, and so we're going to see if we can get the paramedics involved with the fire department for updating uh, fire rescue. So uh, we want to welcome you to WFL HCA, and uh, there's our Smart Dog Productions Beaumont. And uh, we have today uh, two of our students. We have Hassan Tariq, who uh, is our researcher and, and responsible for our webinar content and uh, our tech support. and uh, we have Luke, Dr. Luke Russell with us today, who I've been working with uh, for at least uh, seven or eight years. And so we're glad, to, maybe longer, glad to have him here. Uh, we want to welcome uh, Melodies uh, and the group at Largo Medical Center. So uh, we have to get Melody up to present again. She was a presenter once. And I uh, want to welcome the group. Today we're going to talk about uh, several things, but one of the things we're going to talk about is carotid vascular disease, uh, which is fairly complex. And so um, we're going to present a case with an intraoperative rocky course, which uh, is always to be expected because we're operating on a vascular structure that uh, contains very sensitive barrel receptors, and uh, a lot of people don't think about that and the Perot uh, Jarich reflex, but uh, that certainly is something you should have in your mind whenever you take anybody to carotid surgery. And of course, people who have carotid vascular disease have peripheral vascular disease, and people with other peripheral vascular disease also have cardiac disease. And many years ago, Dr. DeBakey noticed that uh, the clinic was declining every year uh, in those patients with carotid vascular disease, a follow-up period uh, showed that they weren't having strokes, they were dying of heart disease, and so that's how he and the guys at Cleveland Clinic became alert to the combined uh, force of both diseases, and people don't show up in the clinic uh, for follow-up a year later because they have their heart attacks, and so you got to think uh, these are, are two related diseases as part of uh, vasculopathy. And so we have our first case we'd like to present, and uh, we're going to uh, get uh, presentation of uh, this case uh, right now, and I'm going to switch to Dr. Hassan Tariq. Hassan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so let's get started. So this is going to be a quick case. Our patient, WS, is a 70-year-old Caucasian male who actually presented to the Memorial Hospital for a scheduled carotid endarterectomy, just to get an idea of why he was getting the procedure. So in the in the past, the patient actually had a nuclear scan, which showed a fixed and reversible inferior wall defect, some sort of dysfunction. He ended up getting a cardiac cath for this, which showed multivessel disease with a total occlusion of right coronary, 60% of left circumflex, 50% in the LAD, and even a significant occlusion in the left main. An echo from that time also showed the ejection fraction was only 39%. A uh, patient at that time also had a carotid angiography, which showed a 60 to 70 percent uh, proximal right internal coronary arming carotid uh, artery stenosis, and this was followed by an ulcerated plaque. Uh, just a little bit about the history, which goes in agreement with um, what uh, basically his findings were. Patient apparently had an history of an MI. I'm not sure if this was a STEMI or an NSTEMI, and um, uh, I'm not sure if they, he actually got any um, angioplasty for it or what happened with it. Um, the patient also had a history of hypertension for which he was, I guess, on a uh, fluid pill. He had diabetes for which he was getting glabride. He had peripheral vascular disease, peptic ulcer disease. He was on Pylosec, hyperlipidemia. He was on gym fibrosil. Um, I believe he didn't have any allergies. Uh, for his social history, he was known to be a past uh, cigarette smoker, not really sure how many pack years this actually means, but uh, overall he had a sedentary life, no specific diet, and he had a family history which was positive for heart disease. Don't know if this was premature or 
it was uh, if, it, if it's talking about the mom or the dad. So with that patient, uh, with that workup, basically what was decided was because of the carotid disease and the ulcerative plaque, uh, the patient was going to be managed for risk factors, basically medically for the coronary artery disease. So he was put on Toprol and his uh, home medications for other risk factors were actually just continued on. He underwent uh, surgical evaluation and it was decided that he would get a carotid endarectomy for his plaque. So when he came to Memorial and he got the procedure, he had basically sort of a rocky course during surgery and he ended up getting these transient uh, blood pressure elevations, went all the way up to 180 and at the same time his heart rate went down to 30s. Uh, what was uh, of note is also that the patient actually went to the OR with a bradycardia, which was sinus. Post-op patient continued to have some bradycardia. His blood pressure was 165 over 63. Um, heart rate ranged in the 40s. He was put on dopamine when his blood pressure uh, kind of suddenly dropped to 86 by 42. And I'll come back to talk about that. So this is basically just uh, cut out from his anesthesiology report. And you can see here that um, the blood pressures are going all the way from 130 to about 200 here. And his heart rate at the same time was low in his 40s. Yeah, we'll come back to that. So basically as uh, it went on post-op, he developed uh, some tachycardia. His rate went up to 180 when he was put on the dopamine, and he, and he started to have EKG changes. And basically, it looked like it was inferior wall transmyocardial ischemia because of ST segment elevations in the inferior and the lateral leads. There was also some depression seen in the precordial leads. Um, his heart rate um, then eventually slowed down to 152, but his blood pressure went down even further to 65, and he was put on neosinephrine. Patient was also given some cardiothrombolus, and it didn't occur and he was also being given a low pressure at the time uh, of evaluation by Dr. Harrison. So this is basically his EKG post-op, and you can see in the inferior leads 2, 3, and AVF, there's this ST segment elevation, that's, which is like pretty much attached to his QR, as you can see, and um, so pretty significant changes in the EKG. Um, I don't see any ST segment depressions that were suggested before. Yeah, I'll just say a few words about the EKG. There is some ST segment depression over here in V4, yeah. and then there's a little ST segment elevation in lead 3 with some uh, little T wave inversion. There's some depression in uh, lead 1. T waves are not very prominent in V6, as they should be, and so uh, this was a PAC over here, it looks like. And otherwise, the sinus bradycardia. Was this the pre-op EKG? This is post. Post-op. Okay, post-op. Thank you. So I think basically coming out from this, it was decided that the patient was having a periop in fear wall MI. He had a troponin at that time, which was high. I believe it was um, four point something. Mm -hmm. And he was being trended for his troponins. Other than that, he was just being managed for to make sure his heart rate, his rhythm, and blood pressure are all controlled. And um, it's kind of it for this case. Yeah, this is, so this is to show you how difficult it can be uh, in taking care of somebody who has a severe multivessel coronary artery disease. I wasn't asked to clear this patient for surgery, and uh, the reason for doing the calf doesn't seem to be supported by doing anything else. He had you know, a significant obstructive lane, main left coronary artery. It seems like he would have had some uh, coronary artery bypass surgery before doing his carotid, or he would be at uh, Tampa General where he would have the carotid done and then go to surgery or some kind of combination uh, since he wasn't having TIAs. And so it appears to be asymptomatic carotid disease. Someone heard a brewery, somebody found an ulcerated plaque. And so... Uh, not a surprise, and somebody who's a vasculopathy who has peripheral vascular disease and uh, multivessel disease as well as diabetes. And so it's just to show you that this is not such an easy thing, uh, working uh, on the barrel receptor and uh, tugging around on a carotid. And you can see uh, even during surgery, there's neosinephrine, there's ephedrine, same thing, there's nitroglycerin, 
and uh, we've got this up and down, up and down, up and down, and so uh, it's not uh, unexpected that he had complications, uh, and uh, you can see this blood pressure has just gone bonkers, and so uh, this is a hazardous thing, and so we just want everybody to appreciate how difficult it can be. Uh, to, here's a thousand cc's of normal saline. Here's another thousand cc's of normal saline. Uh, here's a pressure of 200, uh, and uh, here we can see uh, the heart rate. And uh, to go in with beta blocker, it was not unexpected in those days, and to be significantly beta blocked. Um, the Dutch gentleman uh, who wrote the articles about beta blockade as a pre-op uh, measure to prevent cardiovascular events during uh, non-cardiovascular surgery. Uh, since then has retracted all of his articles and uh, has been found uh, guilty of uh, a fraud in terms of um, publishing data that is not supported. And so uh, so that, that, that story went down the drain and uh, beta blockade is not such a good thing uh, prior to surgery. I've never, you don't see people going to the OR with sinus bradycardias, and so the, you can see that's very unusual, and uh, may have added to the complications, uh, and uh, going in with main left coronary artery disease, multi-vessel disease, doesn't sound like a very good idea either. I'm not sure why he was studied if we're not going to do anything about it. And so, uh, so the complication of a totally occluded right coronary to get inferior wall ischemia and damage it's not unexpected with the main left lesion that's significant as well. And so this is just to show you how complicated this can be uh, and uh, to point out that it's with some trepidation that patients who are asymptomatic uh, get sent for a carotid revascularization. And so uh, I'm going to show you uh, a patient who is asymptomatic, a female, and we're going to talk about that. So let's go on to the next slide. And uh, women with asymptomatic carotid vascular disease uh, and risk benefit, and the risk of perioperative stroke or death is 8.7%, okay, which is broken down into 6.8% in women, 8.7% uh, in women, excuse me, 6.8% in men. So you can see the perioperative risk of stroke or death is a lot higher in women than it is in men. And then we can look at the uh, absolute reduction with surgery in terms of five-year uh, cumulative risk of ipsilateral ischemic stroke and any perioperative stroke death was greater in men, 11%, and less evident women, 2.8%. So we've got risk, 8.7%, as opposed to 6.8% in men. And then we've got benefit in men of 11%, but in women of only 2.8%. So it's with, uh, and this is based on the most recent trial, the ECST, and the NASA. And so basically to do surgery with this kind of risk with little benefit, and you project this, this is a five-year cumulative risk reduction, five-year. And so we're only seeing 2.8% in five years, so it's going to be a fraction of percent per year over a five-year period, like 0.5%. 0.5 percent per year, uh, a little bit more, 0.6 or so, uh, and so um, not a lot of benefit, a great deal of risk. Arteries are smaller; it's much difficult to operate on them. More usually later in life, more diabetes, more hypertension, sicker patients, and so uh, and uh, no surprise as to what the outcome might be. So uh, Luke uh, Russell is going to tell you a little bit about this, and uh, we'll let Luke take over his part of the presentation. So Luke, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody. So here we do have a 76-year-old female um, who has a history of coronary artery disease and hyperlipidemia, and she presented to Dr. Harrison to um, discuss uh, the prospect of having elective carotid and darterectomy. Um, basically, her primary care provider uh, did a uh, carotid ultrasound uh, for screening purposes and uh, found some significant lesions. Um, he also heard a, a brewery. Uh, so 
she was found to have significant stenosis of the uh, RICA, and we've got some images for that. Um, however, she was completely asymptomatic. Uh, she had no symptoms relating to uh, any neurological issues or blood flow to the brain. Um, but despite that, she was interested in pursuing this um, surgery as a possibility. So uh, again, at the time, she didn't have any other um, symptoms as far as her systems goes. Uh, she was status post uh, PTCA uh, with two stents. Uh, like I said, she had a history of hyperlipidemia for which she was taking the Crestor hypertension for which she took Topril XL. Uh, she was also on uh, lisinopril and uh, aspirin as well. Uh, she was also status post right mastectomy for right-sided uh, breast cancer and had a history of basal cell carcinoma. As far as social history goes, she was a uh, she had a distant history of smoking um, and uh, her physical exam was unremarkable except for that right carotid brewery. So uh, on carotid ultrasound uh, they did identify some uh, non-calcified plaques bilaterally in the common carotids uh, and then the significant uh, or what was thought to be the significant lesion was the proximal right internal carotid artery where she had some heavy calcified plaque, and we'll show you a picture of that. Based on the peak systolic velocity and flow, it was estimated to be um, anywhere from 75 to 99% stenosis. She also had some moderate uh, proximal left internal carotid plaque that was uh, calcified, uh, but not significant with respect to hemodynamics, um, and eventually Based on the carotid images we're about to show you, there was also a CT angio performed, uh, and that um, verified the or concurred with the uh, the findings on ultrasound, and we have some pictures of that for you as well. So uh, here are the images of the carotid ultrasound, and Dr. Harrison, I'm sure, can talk about this a little bit more. Well, carotid ultrasound is a screening test. Ladies with carotid bruise, I don't even do this on if they're asymptomatic because it's opening a can of worms. Basically, risk-benefit ratio has been shown to you, and so there's very little benefit and a huge risk to taking asymptomatic patients and fixing their carotids, either stenting or bypassing. And so... Uh, or CEA, which sometimes includes, frequently includes endodirectomy. And so um, I don't even screen for it. And uh, so this was done uh, by uh, and sent to us uh, for clearance, uh, not for uh, checking out the carotid. And so this was some of the information that we have, and you can see. You don't see any flow on here uh, because we don't have documentation of the flow. All you're seeing is a big hunk of stuff, um, both on one side and the other side of the carotid. This is calcified. Uh, and uh, this is calcified, this is strongly calcified, and then this is non-calcified plaque. This is in the carotid bulb, which is a common site. And uh, now we've got uh, some flow, and we can see minus 2.84 is the high velocity, and we measure that. We've got uh, 239 centimeters per second, which is a significant uh, stenosis. But you have to take this with a grain of salt, so to speak. And so uh, this can be a screening test, but it's certainly not information to operate on. And so an MRI can be done. Uh, unfortunately, it shows dropout of the uh, RE black spot of the calcification. And so it's very hard to distinguish what's going on with MRA. So uh, frequently, the other thing we do is carotid C uh, CT. And the carotid CT does show the calcium. And you can distinguish calcium from non-calcified plaque in the carotid. And understand more about uh, the carotid. So, so this is uh, some CT imaging we'll talk about here in a minute, and uh, and uh, we have some images to show. So we'll have to switch over for that. So hang on, we're going to switch to another workstation. So Luke is uh, scrolling through uh, the CT uh, of the carotids, and you can see the vessel really nicely. You can see where it comes to the calcified area. There's blooming artifact on the calcification. And so you can't see how tight the stenosis is, uh, but you can see that there is some narrowing there. So we take uh, information uh, from the ultrasound, which uh, shows us the velocity of flow 
which was uh, very high. And, uh, and then we look at uh, this for anatomy, uh, look for ulcerations, look for complex plaques. And uh, they're not uncommon. One of the things I've done with uh, males with this is if we see a significant stenosis in an asymptomatic male and we don't see any ulceration, uh, we've done, done PET scans to see if they're active plaques. And if there's a lot of PET activity in the area, then that tells us it's an active plaque. Uh, and those I send to surgery, those who don't have a lot of uh, inflammatory activity on the plaque, I don't send to surgery. And so uh, that's been sort of been using that as a discriminatory. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work out. We treat them medically uh, with Lipitor, uh, our, uh, one of the statin drugs, and we treat them with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. We had one gentleman uh, who had an asymptomatic <laughs> severe carotid stenosis that we were treating medically that was doing great, and he had a, a PET scan that was negative for an inflammatory plaque, so we thought we were doing the right thing until the insurance company uh, declined to continue the Plavix, and he developed TIAs and had to have emergency operation, uh, and it cost the insurance company at least eighty thousand uh, dollars for a, a pill that take, cost two dollars. And so, so we have those little idiosyncrasies happen every once in a while because of insurance company management of medications, which is very unfortunate. And so you can see this plaque pretty well. You can see the heavy calcification. You can see a narrowing at the uh, vessel. And uh, you see the absence of contrast is the most significant thing, where the contrast column has decreased significantly. And so there's no question that this is a significant plaque because of the narrowing of the contrast, not because of the blooming artifact seen with the calcification. So uh, we'll take it from here, Luke. So ultimately, this patient uh, did do well. She um, had an un uneventful uh, peri and postoperative um, course, but obviously, in an in, uh, asymptomatic patient, there was a the, the procedure itself was not without risk. Um, her um, artery was closed with the uh, the Zenosher patch, and um, was uh, was uneventful after the fact. So uh, to conclude, uh, carotid vascular disease in females. Uh, this patient had been seen by a carotid surgeon and sent to me for clearance, and it was discussed in detail, the risk-benefit ratio not being there. patient chose to have the surgery because she was scared, basically said, I might have a stroke, and really couldn't understand that she might have a stroke during surgery, she might have a stroke after surgery, just as well as before surgery. And so, unfortunately, it became a very emotional issue for her. I, I do have patients that have lived to be 99 years old with a severe carotid stenosis of 95% that I followed over periods of 15 or 20 years without symptoms and without having to do anything. I also have patients that have had a hint of a symptom, such as my daughter said my speech was slurred. I don't think it was, but my daughter said clearly it was slurred. And so the patient went to surgery for her severe, quote, symptomatic, close quote, carotid stenosis, and uh, afterwards had what she was trying to avoid, a significant stroke. And so it's uh, something that there's a dif disagreement. Uh, the surgeons seem to be very aggressive and have extrapolated the male data to females and uh, march on ahead uh, with their procedures. Uh, and uh, some surgeons are very good. It's been shown that you have to have a complication rate that's extremely low in order to do surgery on people who don't have the risk-benefit ratio there. And so the least experienced carotid surgery surgeons are basically really can't justify what they're doing, even on the symptomatic people, because of the need of demonstrating a low morbidity rate.
Um, there is a medical treatment for carotid vascular disease, which is dual antiplatelet therapy and lipid therapy, exercise, and uh, diet. And uh, it's never been well controlled in the research studies that the control group is well treated. Uh, and some of the biggest studies involved the VA hospitals where there was no attention to the control group in terms of medical management. So uh, the data is, data, data is kind of shaky. So I just want everyone to take this in consideration for their selves, their families, and uh, patients that they're advising. Uh, we're going to go on to something else to talk to you about uh, for a minute, and uh, that is uh, carotid, uh, and that's away from the carotid disease, and uh, back to uh, our issue that we discussed last time, which is uh, CCTA instead of cardiac cath. And so we've been doing CT, uh, CCTA since 2004, and we did it on 16 slice scanners. There was nothing wrong with 16 slice scanners. We just had more slices that came together, more risk of artifact. But if you control the heart rate, you had beautiful images. So we're starting to have data uh, with 11 and 12 year follow-up uh, from our 5,000 cases. And so it's really interesting to look at that uh, in longitudinally and uh, see what's happening with these patients as we follow up on them. So. I'm going to give you the benefit of that by showing you uh, one of our patients. That's a very interesting patient. So hang on. And uh, this doesn't show up very good. It's taken from my iPhone, and uh, it's an earlier generation iPhone. I haven't been able to keep up with the iPhone progress. But uh, the main thing to show you is I, I don't have uh, the CT slices, but I do have pictures that we gave the patient. And so this is a lady who's 54 years old. And uh, she's uh, married a Greek female who noticed progressive tightness in her chest and neck when exercising on her home treadmill. That was getting more and more uh, tight when she was exercising on less and less exercise. And so her physician called me from his office and said she was sitting there. And I said, well, I'm sitting here at the imaging center. At that time, we were at Tower Diagnostic on Habana. And uh, that was 2005. So I said, I'm sitting here at the imaging center. Send her over. And so the lady comes over, and we did a coronary <coughs> CTA. With, uh, we didn't have step and shoot and eye dose then. We did have tube modulation. So we could cut down on some of the radiation during systole by the uh, tube shutting down during systole and only activating during diastole. And so we want to show you, first we have the left anterior descending. And there is an artifact in here that makes it more difficult to see what's going on. But in the left, and you can see there's some, uh, some of the slices didn't quite come together well because of her heart rate. But nevertheless, uh, in her left anterior descending, there's a severe lesion uh, that uh, was proximal. And of course, you can see this one even better because this is the diagonal vessel. And here's a severe lesion in the diagonal vessel. That's a small vessel. And so with this information, she went from the diagnostic center to Tampa General, to the cath lab. Uh, cath lab had an opening. She was NPO. And so we fixed it. So she got a stent and a stent. So one overnight stay after getting stents. In those days, you would stay overnight. And, uh, and one, one test. Uh, which I'm not sure if Medicare, well, it's not Medicare. I'm not sure if insurance even paid for this test. But one test, and uh, we were one and done. And so we were very happy with that. And uh, the angioplastic interventionalist was very happy to, one, get the case, and two, uh, to have uh, landmarks and to have pretty well laid out what to do and where. Made it very simple. So we followed her for 11 years, and uh, she did very well until, and so she developed progressive neck pain and chest pain on exertion on her treadmill. It's deja vu all over again. And so to make it deja vu even more, we invite her over on Friday to come in and get an emergency CT scan, 
and uh, we can show you right here the lesion after the uh, stent and uh, this is uh, one of the there's got two stents here and this is a, a lesion and there was a lesion in the diagonal where the diagonal was very barely filling and a lesion in the left hand you're descending just beyond the stents too sometimes it's called the Tootsie Roll effect where you have a stenosis prior to the stent and then a stenosis after the stent and this was heavily fibrotic there was no uh, necrotic core and uh, easy to see and uh, to point out and the patient was relieved to find out what was going on and uh, went back home and was not willing to stay at home because she felt more chest discomfort and so she went to Tampa General where she'd had her previous stenting amid the helter and skelter of the emergency room and of course the disjointed lack of coordination as you amble through the system to get admitted to a hospitalist that you don't know to finally get a consult with the person who's going to do the angioplasty on Monday and uh, to get a, uh, a tridel drip and uh, stop her medications and all the things that happen and the choice of heparin and uh, with uh, possible instant stenosis which she didn't have it was all post stenosis and so finally everything got sorted out at the hospital and then she had stenting uh, on the uh, LED and we'll show you some of the stuff so hang on just a minute and we'll show you the actual images of CT and then hopefully we'll show you uh, the stenting so these are very beautiful images and so when I go through an image the first thing I do is I look for misregistration to make sure that I'm not getting artifacts and so I'm going to look for where the slices came together best way to do that is to uh, sort of window down a little bit and make the slices more accentuated and so now you can see that this is a slice coming along here that there's another one coming along here and so uh, probably another one coming along here so it's much easier to identify where the slices of this scanner in terms of time resolution come together and could create artifacts and so with that in mind then when I go over to the image I'll know that what I'm seeing is actually between slices where they fit together and so therefore is not an artifact so we've defined that so look, it's so nice to do the volume remedy image and to look at it and see what you see because usually the answer is right in front of you. And so here's the answer. Uh, this is a couple stents in the left anterior descending and here's the severe stenosis in the left anterior descending uh, where the vessels pinch down. You can look at the right and the right looks great. And we can look at the circumflex. Circumflex looks good. And then the diagonal, and here's the diagonal stent coming right here. And it usually makes the artery bigger than it was before. It looks like it's uh, these two stents are actually spanning the diagonal. So it looks like it may be a jailed diagonal uh, looking at this. And then there's a sudden cessation of flow beyond the stent. And so, and then it takes up again down here. So it looks to me like it may be totally occluded and there may be some distal collateral flow, although the collateral is not identified. So let's take a look some more and see what we can figure out. And so you've seen what we can see in the volume rendered image, which is really pretty. So let's go over here and let's go over here so I like to look at these images and I like to look for ancillary findings and so I'm going to look at the aorta and I'm going to see if there's some aortic calcification and frequently there's calcification at the ligamentum teres where uh, the patent ductus used to be before it closed off and then uh, we can see pulmonary outflow track uh, right ventricular outflow tract, pulmonary valve, 
right ventricle, left ventricle, you can look for any uh, scarring, thinning the left ventricle, replacement of calcification, replacement with fat. And so you move the pericardium. You can look under the diaphragm. You can look for breast calcification or breast nodules. And we come over here to this image. That was the sagittal. This is the coronal. We can see the left atrial appendage, so the pulmonary veins coming in to the left atrium, superior vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle, tricuspid valve, pulmonary artery, pulmonary uh, valve, aortic valve, the diaphragms, stomach, hiatal hernia, spine, breast. So very nice images. Let's go over here and examine the axial. Let's look at the pulmonary arteries and make sure there's no pulmonary emboli. So that's it. There's the internal mammary arteries. Well, well shown here. Breast shadows. Usually we move this around a little bit to see what we can see of the pulmonary arteries looking for a pulmonary emboli. So let's do that. Here we go. Pulmonary artery, pulmonary arteries. And you got to look very carefully to see if there's a cutoff. And they can't be confused, confused with the pulmonary veins. So we circle through here. Again, we look for uh, internal mammary arteries supplying mammary arteries supplying the breast to look for a tumor blush. If you don't see, and then you look for mediastinal abnormal structures. And we do a triple rule out looking at the aorta for a dissection. It's gated, so you're not going to have any motion. And looking for pulmonary emboli. We do this frequently in patients that present to the emergency room. Just got to get their heart rate slow enough. Then we can uh, put that back the way it was. And then scroll through the axial images. Again, looking for scar, fatty replacement, thinning. Papillary muscles, mitral valve. If you see chordae, it's really a good study. If you can see chordae. That's my definition of a good study, being able to see chordae tendinae. So there's a cord. Aortic valve. So once we've done all that, a thorough analysis, then we're ready to go back to the to the uh, coronary arteries. So let's go back to the coronary arteries now. I take the volume rendered image, position it the way I want it, get some right size, and then we can look at these arteries. So let's take a look. And this is our segmentation. And it's awfully bright. Make it less bright. And then we can increase the transverse slices. And we can put them across here and then we have a blue dot that we move along the artery 
and then I can't see that right now. We move this little blue line over here and we come to the area of stenosis and we can color code this. It's kind of pretty with sure plaque and we can see that the density of this is such that it color codes for being blood and so you don't see the stenosis anymore but let's take the color code off because that's one of the problems with the color code is it's color coding to look for um, necrotic core and fibrosis and uh, this happens to be an area of fibrosis that is entering the criteria of contrast so but you can see it doesn't have the density quite of contrast so let's see what density it is so let's scroll along the coronary looking at contrast and we've got contrast in the 5 600 range as we scroll along 618 and then we come to this area and we got 238 242 so that's uh, fibrosis that's very dense and not a surprise after a stent is there any instant stenosis well we have to brighten this up a little bit to see and we can actually let's tone it let's tone it this way and let's color code it and see there we go so looking in here I'm trying to go through the stent two stents and see if I see any a channel first and then see if I see some very dark areas of dense fibrosis like this and so I don't see that inside the stents and so we conclude that the stents are okay it's just a post stent high grade area of fibrosis it doesn't have a necrotic core so it's not a vulnerable plaque so we really don't have to, don't have to worry about this clotting right there other than decreased flow it's not going to be a plaque that ruptures could clot but doesn't have to rupture it depends on the platelet reactivity and the blood flow so let's go over here and look at the diagonal vessel let's see what we can make out from it and so it does fill distally we're not sure why but it's filling distally not much turns out that that could be collateral flow and it could be filling retrograde and there's our string sign distal to the stent there is some darkening inside the stent I don't know how the flow is in the stent but I would suspect it's not normal and that uh, darkening there doesn't look good and could represent dense fibrous tissue in the stent so let's go into that dark area see what yeah we get 249 so that is the density of fibrous tissue that dense because it's the same as what we were having what we were having inside that other stent I mean on the uh, distal side of the other stent and so here we go let's take a look at this in terms of color coding and see if there's any necrotic core over here and we don't see any necrotic core and uh, it looks like it's occluded don't see much of anything it's not even coding for contrast in this area here it looks like it's occluded and then let's do an attenuation contrast attenuation progression here and see the contrast is 116 120 125 140 so it doesn't it looks like it's all this pretty homogeneous contrast but low density homogeneous 
So it's not a lot of contrast in there. It's kind of diluted out. It's probably retrograde flow. And so that tells us more about this vessel, which is probably not a target. And so we can try to extend this a little bit. There we go. We extend it a little bit. And it looks like it's gotten, there is, there's more contrast density distally in this vessel than there is proximally just beyond the occlusion. And so that would make you think that this is retrograde flow. Low contrast density here, not much, and then it increases dramatically here. So retrograde flow is the conclusion. So we do have the cardiac cath, right? And here we go with the cardiac cath. And uh, first thing you see is a couple stents in the left anterior descending. And then you see the left anterior descending filling very slowly. You also see a vessel filling late, which is over here, which is the diagonal vessel. And you can see it fills retrograde and as it fills it gets denser and denser and then it sort of loses its density just beyond where it was stented and now we can see the LAD stenosis after the stent which is severe the large LAD going down to the apex. We can see the other stent in the diagonal vessel, which is above the stents in the LED. And you can see very clearly that there are collaterals, probably from the distal circumflex, which is posterior, that are circling around and filling the diagonal retrograde where it doesn't quite connect, almost gets to the stent, probably does, barely. And you can see the attenuation of contrast that we demonstrated, where the contrast is very bright and full distally in the vessel, but attenuates as we go further towards the stent. And you can see exactly what we demonstrated in terms of attenuation of contrast supporting the existence of collateral flow. Here again, left anterior is sending the stents, the LED gives off a large septal perforator, and then post-stent stenosis, and then a diagonal vessel coming in retrograde late. So um, the cath didn't tell us anything we didn't know. And of course the circumflex and right coronaries are fine, which we already knew. So nice detailed information from the CT. And now we've got a little shaking there of the image, but we've got a wire down the left anterior descending and looks like there's been some ballooning because uh, we're getting better flow and there's the balloon in place again and this is post balloon angioplasty and stenting a new stent for that post-stent stenosis. Now we get three stents in a row. And then the diagonal being so small and uh, having a post-stent stenosis and maybe uh, being inaccessible because it's jailed uh, basically wasn't stented then because it's too much risk, too complicated for too small a vessel and it's filling retrograde anyway so we don't expect it to be a problem.
So that concludes our presentation today. And uh, thank you very much. It's nice. It's interesting to see an 11-year follow-up from CT 16 slice 11 years ago. And the patient demonstrated what needed to be fixed and fixing it. And then 11 years later, the patient's used to that. She comes over and says, you know, I've had progressive chest pain again. Uh, let's go look at the CT scan. And so, so we do the CT scan, sure the lesion. She said, okay, I'm ready to go get it fixed. And so it looks pretty simple, doesn't it? Certainly a lot simpler than, than we try to make it with spec scans and exercise tests and all the crazy stuff. So thank you so much for attending, and we enjoyed having you, uh, Christine, uh, Teresa, uh, Mary, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.